When I was in college, my senior year, I took a class with Father Heath Curtis, who is now the head of stewardship for the Senate and a pastor in Southern Illinois. Class was called Church and Its Ministry, and of course we changed it right away because the church is not a dog you can neuter, but rather a female, a bride. It is not church and its ministry, but church and her ministry. So once we got the title corrected, and of course the dean of students really didn't care, nor did the registrar that we changed the title. Well, they did because they didn't like us pompous pre-sem guys too much. But it was a good group of guys. A couple of them are now pastors, a couple are professors, and one of them, of course, is the guy talking now. And it was a beautiful class. We read articles on the church and the Office of the Holy Ministry, articles by Kurt Marquardt, Norman Nagel, Herman Sasse, C.F.W. Walther, or Wilhelm Lea, and, of course, the man, not a myth, but definitely a legend, Dr. Martin Luther of blessed and holy memory. But the chief article we read to get the class going was the seventh article of the Augsburg Confession, which was right confessed June 25th, 1530. And in that article, the Lutherans, Luther, Melanchthon, Bugenhagen, all these cool cats, they were confessing what the church is in order that we may know our true unity, what unites us as the bride of Christ. And in that article, it confesses the church is that assembly of all believers amongst whom the gospel is purely preached and the sacraments are administered in accordance with the gospel. And then Father Curtis asked us a question. He said, now this says what the church is. But does it also say what the church is not? And that was the question that drove the entire semester of study. Of course, all of us that first day said, well, of course it tells you what the church is not. Because the church is not those who deny baptismal regeneration. Those who deny the bodily presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. Those who deny passive righteousness, that God does all the work. And we pounded our chests in pride that we were able to point out who the church is and who the church isn't. Similar to the question that John's disciples asked in our text today. John in prison, and why is John in prison again? Because he won't shut up. John can't shut his mouth. He won't stop talking. T trust me, if John the Baptist were alive today, he would be, not even, there's this thing called the CRM list in the Missouri Senate, which means you don't have a call, you're not at a church, but you're kind of like drifting in limbo as a pastor. He wouldn't even be on that. John would be blacklisted. He would be on a list, don't ever talk to this guy. The dude brings a locust and wild honey casserole to every potluck. He condemns everybody, no matter if they're rich or poor. The dude smells terrible, and all he does is point his finger at some other dude and say, follow him. Even though we bring up all this stuff, all he says is, follow him. I'm decreasing, that dude is increasing. He wouldn't do well. And of course, his mouth got him in trouble, and he's in prison because even the dude in charge, when John said, hey, hey that's not your wife, that's your brother's wife, you shouldn't do that. And of course, in prison. So in this dark dungeon, in the prison, John then hears the deeds of the Christ and he sends his disciples to him. Now there's a lot of debate. Did John do this because John doubted? John doubted that really this guy is the Christ and a few fathers debated that like St. Ambrose and St. Jerome and all these guys. And Luther, of course, dealt with it quickly and said, let's not debate that because it doesn't matter. The reality is John sent his disciples to Jesus. And they come to Jesus and they say, are you the one who is coming? Or shall we await for someone else? Jesus doesn't chastise them. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't yell at them. He doesn't say, get away from me. What he says is, oh, 
pilgrim on back and tell John what you see, the works, and what you hear, the words. The blind see again. The lame walk. Lepers are made clean. The deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. So he's building, right? Jesus is building up to that key point. And then he says the best one. He says, and the poor have joyful news brought to them. And happy is the one who isn't scandalized by me. And then they go back. So what he's saying to these disciples is, hey, that dude needs it because guess what? That guy sitting in prison, he's not a reed shaken by the wind. He doesn't go along with the whims of society. He doesn't go along with cultural attitudes. He doesn't care what's woke. He just preaches unadulterated and unconditionally. And that's where he is now. So it's not a reed shaken by the wind. And he doesn't have soft clothing because he's not some house theologian that gets to sit in the home of the king and quip deep wisdom and insights from the scriptures. No, this is the one. This is the greatest one because it doesn't say more than a prophet. It says greater than a prophet because this is the one that is greater than Elijah, greater than Isaiah, greater than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, greater than all of them. This is the forerunner, John the Baptist. For no one born among women has arisen greater than him. It's not Jordan or LeBron. It's not Muhammad versus Mike. It's not Andre versus Ric Flair. It's John the Baptist. He's the goat. And yet, he who is the least in the kingdom of the heavens is greater than him. So go back and tell John what you hear and see, that one who is the greatest, and they did. They go back and they report it. You did right, John. You trusted in the right one. Your faith clung and still clings to he who raises the dead, he who gives the lame the ability to walk, he who gives the blind back their sight, he who opens up the ears of the deaf that they may hear, but most importantly, he who is the one who preaches the joyful news to those who are poor in spirit. What the church is, is known by her work and her word. That question, does it tell you what the church is or the church isn't, is your emphasis. Because we only have a f short few breaths on this earth, don't we? I was holding Killy Goat Gruff the other day. That's my nickname for him, Killy Goat Gruff. And I was holding him the other day, and I realized I can't do this with Lonnie now. I could, but it'd be awkward. You know, it'd be a little weird, us staring at each other, him putting his hand in my mouth. Be a little weird. But it's like that, isn't it? They're, 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 they're this li like little kale, there is, is this little bitty thing right now, and then you blink and it's gone. And that's our life. It, it goes by so quickly, so we don't have time to be so negative and go, what isn't something? My wife is Allison Hall. I could spend all my days telling you who isn't my wife and demeaning every other woman in the world. Or, I can just love my wife and abide in that joy. Luther said this, Where Christ is, there surely the gospel will be preached. Where the gospel is not preached, there Christ is not present. My brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit has brought you here today not to await for some other one, but to receive he who has come into the world to bear your sin and be your Savior. That you who are the least in the kingdom of the heavens may be greater than John because John did the greatest work. John, no one can top the work of St. John the Baptist. 
from a human perspective. There's no work you can do that beats that. But that's not why you are great in the kingdom of the heavens. But we do the works, don't we? Especially around this time of the year. We do things because that's where our trust is. Fear drives us to do these works and to put our trust in those things instead of trusting in he who has come in his work and in his word. So my brothers and sisters, may all hope and works be dashed to pieces this day in you, that you may trust only in the one who has come, that you may not be scandalized by him, but instead joyful in the news brought to you. You who hate yourself because of your sins, you who beat yourself up every day because you know you should be better and you want to be better, and yet you're not. Take heart and rejoice today. For the kingdom of heaven is here for you. For look at the works. There in the font, water combined with the word. And this day, little Caleb brought to those waters. Why? Because someone brought you, Hannah, to those waters. Someone brought you, Austin, to those waters. Well, I mean, they're right here. <laughs> they brought you. And who brought them? The ones before them and the ones before them. The Holy Spirit bringing you and showing you that's where Jesus is. You don't have to wonder where is he. He's right there in the font. This day, St. Caleb united with Christ in a death like his, that he may be united with him in a resurrection like his. Take heart, you who wonder where Jesus is. He's right here under bread and wine given for you, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sin. Take heart, you who want to know where Jesus is. You who are in the darkness of the dungeon of your existence. You who every day seems dark and bleak and depressing and it seems like there's no hope in sight. It's just a valley of sorrow. Take heart, for in this ah, sinful mouth, don't pay attention to the rest of it. Uh, do I have a good personality? No, I'm annoying. You either love me or you hate me. That's one or the other. There's no one in the middle. Hey, what do you think about Chris Hall? Can't stand him. What do you think about him? Eh, he looks good in lavender. That's about it. And it's fun times. But it doesn't matter what, you, what my personality is. It doesn't matter if I'm the smartest dude in the room or the dumbest dude in the room. All that matters is one thing, and that is that Jesus is proclaimed. And through this fallen, sinful, depraved, and sometimes smelly mouth, comes forth for you joyful news today that you are forgiven. That no matter what you brought with you today, no matter what the sin is, no matter if you sold it to someone else and they said, that is deplorable. No, you are forgiven because Christ took it and bore it on the cross for you. And just like John didn't send one disciple but two, so now you are not alone. You are in this great consolation, consoling one another, conversing with each other, saying to each other, and this is, this is the best part. Remember I said life is short, it's gone like a blink? It's, it's for everything. So think of it this way. Wouldn't this be great if this was our goal for the year? I'll talk with um, all the church leadership and say, this is the one thing we're doing this year. It's going to be awesome. We're just saying one thing to each other. Hey, Jesus loves you. He died for you, and you're going to live with him forever. Hey, Jesus loves you. He died for you, and you're going to live forever. Hey, Jesus loves you. He died for you, and we're going to live forever with him. Is there anything better to say than that? What else can we say? That's what we're gifted to say. That's what Jesus said. Pilgrim on, brothers, and tell John that. And it's the same thing today. Pilgrim on and say it to each other. Because my beloved brothers and sisters, this gout it is Sunday, let us rejoice in that reality. This is where Jesus is. This is where the church is, where his gospel is preached to those who need to hear it. People like you and like me. May the Holy Spirit bless us with his mercy that it may endure until Christ comes back again. Not with anger, but only with redemption. To take us unto the age to come. In Jesus' name, amen.